Hey everyone, welcome to the September edition of the NA10 Community Hangouts. This is the, the ninth time we've done it this year, and as we were just saying to each other in the chat, these things are getting bigger and bigger, and that's really, really exciting and uh, and and satisfying for us to see that so many people are interested in this. Um, we have a bit of a, a special theme today. We're talking about all kinds of uh, AI topics. Um, we have uh, an NA10 engineer Oleg talking about product updates in the AI departments. We have Max, uh, our DevRel, talking about his 30 days AI sprints. And then we have special guest, uh, Eugenia Sudoskaya. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> Jenny. Sorry about that. Um, from Quadrant, giving an overview of their, uh, their products, explaining what a factor store is, uh, and giving a demo of a really cool use case with, uh, with NA10. So the uh, full program, I'll start with as usual with community updates. Then Oleg from our AI team will give you the product updates. We have a couple of new jobs that we'd like to share with you. Then it's Max, and then finally it's Jenny. And in between each section, there'll be, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions as well. <clears throat> After the last talk, the recording will stop and we'll have an informal community chat uh, with everyone. So let's get to it. On the community side, um, Max, Oleg, uh, Liam and I have been in Prague last week uh, for uh, our first meetup there. And uh, this was really exciting. Uh, Liam, uh, one of our ambassadors, he's in the call right now. He's actually from Philadelphia and he came all the way to Prague uh, to join us there. Um, so this was a very special uh, occasion for us. Uh, we had about 50, 15 people uh, show up. Uh, it was a really great venue, very nice, uh, nice atmosphere. Um, we learned that about half of them were new to NA10. So Max stepped in and did like a three minute crash course uh, for NA10. I can look to you, Amherst. Please mute your mic. Luis, can you mute your mic? Thanks. <clears throat> and after that, uh, Liam showed an amazing project he's been building uh, like on top of NA10 or inside NA10, I should say. He's actually been changing the code to add unit testing to it. Um, it was pretty mind blowing. Also inside the team, we were like very impressed with what he was doing. And a full video of his presentation will be uh, shared uh, early next week, uh, and you'll be able to download uh, his image as well to try it out for yourself. So it's really really cool stuff. Then Oleg had two presentations. He showed uh, he first showed how he connected Siri on his macOS desktop with uh, a workflow, so he could run workflows like have Siri explain what he saw on screen by running it through an AI agent uh, and returning the, uh, the information as like spoken uh, content, which was really cool. Um, and then he showed a new concept we're working on, which is Nodes as a tool. Um, and he will cover a bit of that later in his presentation today as well. And then Max gave an overview of the 30 days sprint, which was like still a bit younger at that time than today. Um, but he has a lot of very, very, very cool projects to, to share with everyone. And as I said, all the videos will be available next week, so you can enjoy uh, all these presentations then as well. Um, upcoming events. Um, our next Hangout will be on October 31st, and it's going to be a workflow showcase again, which means you guys can submit ideas for crazy or interesting or different uh, workflows that you've worked on and take four or five minutes to share it with the rest of the community. And everyone who participates will receive one of our exclusive notebooks uh, as a as a thank you note uh, for this. Um, you can go to nsn.io slash community slash events to see a list of these events. And in the workflow showcase, there's a link where you can submit your uh, your idea. And then we'll get back to you about two weeks before the event or so. Then two other things, we are going to have another meetup in Amsterdam in early November. We're still planning this, but details should be available next week. And uh, we are also going to do our first proper hackathon in Berlin this December. Uh, and this is still very early days, but we're aiming to have like a really nice big event, uh, like relatively close to the office, so we can get some some team members and engineers and support people all join in to have a great uh, event together. Um, at the same time, we're still um, looking for help with organizing some more events, and like right now, we're specifically looking for. London, Paris, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Paris is getting a little closer. We're working with some people who are very, uh, very promising. Um, London, I'm still looking for someone who's passionate about uh, N8N and who has a bit of experience doing these kind of events and who enjoys like uh, interacting with people. So if that's you, please head over to n8n.io/ambassadors and uh, 
submit an application form and I'll get back to you for, for a chat and see how, how you could help us with that. That would be really, really great. Um, are there already any questions here? Probably not, right? No. All right, um, Oleg, that means you're up next with product updates from the AI team. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. So I don't have any cool workflow to show you today, uh, but I, as seeing as this is AI focused Hangouts, I would like to give you a short update what's been happening in the uh, AI team in the Q3 and what our plans are for Q4. Uh, so most importantly, we got two new engineers on board, JP and Eugene, uh, and uh, one designer, Jason. Uh, I think Eugene and Jason are both in the chat uh, in the call today, so feel free to say hi. Uh, we also, at the beginning of the quarter, uh, we focused on simplifying, uh, uh, introducing some simplified use case notes, uh, as we are seeing some patterns how the basic LLM chain was used, was used with the output parser, but so you don't have to fiddle with setting up the output parser yourself. We added these, uh, these three notes to basically help you achieve these use cases without that much extensive knowledge about like the blank chain and whatnot. Uh, we focus also a bit on uh, self-hosted, uh, added support for Olama into the tools agent and some other providers, uh, made it the, the default agent type from conversational agent uh, as it should be more reliable. Uh, we released a self-hosted AI starter kit, which was a big hit. Uh, currently it's sitting at around 2.6, 2.7 stars at GitHub. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please go check it out. It's basically a Docker Compose file with all the services like Olama, Quadrant, uh, Postgres, and of course, NA10 already configured together. And you can run it both on CPU and GPU so that you can use uh, you can use a local AI in your NA10 workflows, uh, potentially even running uh, running them offline without sending any data to anywhere. Uh, then we've improved the file upload, or rather added the file upload to our chat trigger uh, and merged the chat trigger with the, you know, this uh, debug chat in the canvas, like when you're developing a workflow. So you can now upload files, uh, you can control which files to upload. And we also handle parsing of the files to, or parsing of the images to the tools agent. So if you have a vision model connected to the tools agent, it would automatically recognize images. Uh, but of course you can also use it for summarization of, of files and so on. Uh, and there's been many more uh, UX and uh, usability improvements and, and bug fixes. Uh, but our main initiatives for the quarter were uh, simplifying the usage of the nodes as a tool. Uh, for that, we worked on a project called Node as a Tool, which would basically allow you to connect uh, like a subset of uh, the nodes from NA10 directly to the tools agent uh, and being able to specify like what parameters you want for the agent to pass to the node. So then you wouldn't have to fiddle with the whole uh, sub workflow uh, tool and it should make it much more easier to, to get started with these agents and to use the integrations that uh, you might wanna use. Uh, another one, uh, another initiative for the quarter that we progressed on was the evaluation or rather the uh, execution data, uh, execution data aggregation. Uh, this feature allows you to basically tag your past execution with uh, custom tags, so giving it thumbs up, thumbs down, so you can share it like between team members to sort of, like exporting them. Uh, and in the future, it would also be available for uh, evaluation. And that's bringing me to our plan for Q4. If you go to the next slide, Art. Uh, so we're going to continue with these. Uh, main uh, initiatives, uh, releasing the node as a tool and also working on the evaluation. Uh, we want you to allow to be able to create like a test workflows and to be able to specify criteria uh, to see like how your workflow tests are passing, failing. Um, so you, you can do that, you will be able to do that uh, from NA10. We're also starting to see some common rack use cases and want to simplify that as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much details about this one yet, as still the specs are pending, but it's definitely you can expect something in this quarter. Uh, also simplify tools usage with the AI agents, with the, both the nodes as a tool, uh, but also we want to improve how the sub-workflow tool works, uh, giving you 
bit more visibility over uh, the kind of parameters that your agent passes and make it more reliable. And finally, we want to also make some more chat uh, improvements, allow you to render more complicated chat elements and be able to control flow, the flow there. Um, last point here is that we are actively looking for people to talk to regarding this, these AI features so we can learn how you are using them, maybe what's missing in them, what you would like to see, uh, or things that you're struggling with. Uh, so if you would be interested to having a short user interview, uh, please feel free to reach out on this uh, link. I'm also going to post them in the chat in a bit. And yeah, we'll get in touch. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thanks, Oleg. Um, and yeah, I think the, the link is coming up. Um, you kind of predicted there would not be many questions. And I was keeping an eye on the chat and you were right. There was nothing specific about this. Questions about the AI starter kit, um, but they've been answered in chat already. So that means we can we can continue. There's, there is one question, but uh, I answered, I can fully answer. It's how might someone get the, basically the self-hosted AI starter kit if they've already installed today, you know, and, and separately. Oh, uh, it depends how you install it. If you're running it via Docker, then you can just copy some of these, uh, some of the directives from the Docker Compose file in that uh, starter kit. Uh, make sure you connect the network uh, or specify the network directive to, to make that uh, both all the containers are in the same network. And you should be able to, to fire, fire it really effortlessly. Back up your DB first. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Backing up is always a good idea. Yeah. Was that all, Max? Are there any other questions? That's why I saw those announcements. All? all right, great. Okay. Well, guys, if, if we missed something, let us know, and we'll get back to it later. Right? Um, thanks, Alec. Great updates. Exciting stuff coming up in Q4. Then, very quick update on the job front. Um, as always, we have a, a list of jobs, but our hiring team asked me to put a spotlight on these two roles. We're looking for a senior product manager on the integration side. So that means you're going to be working with the nodes team, helping make sure we have the right focus and we understand the needs of our, of our users. And the uh, go-to-market team is looking for a senior data analyst to help us crunch the numbers and see the impact of the work that we're doing. Um, we have more jobs, so have a look on nitn.io slash careers if you want to know more. There's also a lot of information there about our, our company culture and uh, how we work together, how we work remote uh, throughout Europe, etc. Very good stuff. Um, and with that, uh, it is time for you, Max. Um, what do you want to do? You want to share your screen? Um, I, I can speak for a second, then I'll, I'll share my screen in a moment. Okay, okay cool. Stop sharing if, if you like. Yeah. Um, hey everyone, so good to see you all. Um, so some of you that are sort of deep in the NNN community might know what I'm about to talk about, um, but I've been doing a 30-day AI sprint for the last 25 days now, it's day 25, and I'll just give a little context as to, you know, why why am I doing this? So I transitioned into DevRel at NNN from design um, about six, eight weeks ago. It's, it's been a sort of a transition period. Um, and one of the things I realized that we need to do more of is content that shows people how to use NNN, but also inspires people how to use NNN. I think uh, in the content I've been doing today, there was plenty of power users that didn't even know about the form trigger, for example. You know, and at Team NNN, that's table stakes. We all sort of know about the form trigger, and that's just one example. So it's about getting the word out, and I think showing people what's feasible today with AI, and then what also just the learnings from, from doing this stuff, you know, in production and building it. So that's what I've been doing for the last 25 days. It's been a whirlwind journey, uh, not so much sleep. Honestly, it's all self-imposed. I just can't stop building. It's very difficult to. And we've launched a ton of projects. Um, and I'll share my screen and go over a few of those projects. But everything I've built, it's all freely available for you to clone, duplicate, change. Um, you know, I've gotten a few people that have critiqued some of the flows that I've built. And, and rightfully so, you know, some of these were sort of knocked out and put up. And I think the thing about building imperfect um, with NNN shows firstly that you can ship something imperfect that creates value um, as an MVP, as a minimum viable product. And then that it's possible to improve it and make it better. For some use cases, that's gonna be before you uh, will launch the production, because it's very important. And for other use cases, like an internal op something, um, you might launch that sooner. But um, being able to show people what that looks like when you're actually building today has been, I think, really rewarding. A lot of people have been really appreciating it. 
So let me, I just send a request. Yeah. To be yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And Max, you, you've also been working with a couple of community members on these projects, right? That's right. So that's what I can go over in a second when I um, I show off all the things that we've been doing here. I do have about a, 1 million taps. So if you just give me one second here, I'll find that. And I believe you're about to see a quick tab. Yeah. So Project Du Jour, this is a project we actually launched today. I built this along with Oscar from the from our community. Oscar runs an amazing channel where he makes great YouTube videos um, about NXN. And, and he's also a professional automator. So for me, it was really fun working with him because I think that's our community members that often know a lot of the, you know, serious NXN uh, production, you know, skills uh, more than some of us. So we launched this today. It's on Product Hunt. Um, and what Email Spy does, if I visit it, it scrapes various different websites uh, for a given search domain and outputs an email. So if I search for NNN here, this should work in about a couple of seconds because I've already ran this query before and we're caching this. Um, but this entire experience that you're seeing here, you see this, there's three emails we found and we've seen the different websites we found these on. So here we're finding our, on the NNN website on Crunchbase um, and how this uh, workflow works, for example, its backend is all powered by this workflow here. Now I'm not gonna go into the details of each workflow, um, but I do have a vlog for the AI Sprint where I do go into those details. And in the next one, I recorded a session with Oscar who went over a lot of the details of this. Oscar did a lot of the, the heavy moving parts of this workflow. But in a nutshell, what we're doing is we take in the uh, that domain name, uh, we perform some searches using Brave Search, and then we have a few different methods where we're analyzing that. So one method is using Puppeteer. This is a home role solution that Oscar built. And another yeah. method- Max, Max, sorry for interrupting. Could you zoom in a little bit to make the readability better? Sure thing, sure thing. Yeah, perfect. And then, um, there's two other paths that basically use different AI methods in combination with traditional scraping to output um, whatever emails we can find for that given domain. And then we merge that all together and you duplicate that sort of more standard ETL and then send it to the front end. Now, again, if you like the details of, of this, or if you want to rebuild this um, project, it's all available in the 30 day AI Sprint um, Notion homepage. Um, so in here is a little details on the project, the various projects I've launched, um, links to the vlog. And then also if we scroll down here, this is the single source of truth for the projects I'm building. So there's email spy, that's the one I just showed you today. Starlens is a GitHub profile analyzer, very cool stuff. We've got a research paper summary assistant um, and, and a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but for email spy, that's the project that we're launching today. And I think it's the most complex one we've done so far. And it really shows some moving parts. It shows um, using AI agents in what I would say is a production use case. You know, I think a lot of folks, if they added a few more bells and whistles to this, this could be a paid SaaS for certain roles. We were giving it away totally free because this is just an inductive tool for you guys to understand how we built that. Um, some of the cool details about a project like this is that you might not see in like introductory content is you know this workflow could fail at any uh, one of these steps, right? It's, it's possible that happens in production. Uh, the way Oscar set it up is the error workflow receives the callback from this workflow and so it'll send it to the front end. So if you're using it today, you know, it may fail a few percent of the time because again, we're doing web scraping of dozens of sites and you know, we, we put this together in a few days. But the nice thing is, is there's a flexibility in NNN to, for example, serve the user uh, an error message. Now, I was trying to conjure that error message to show you that. It's a little too robust. We've been, we've been improving it throughout the day, so it's kind of hard to do. Um, but yeah, go check this out and um, tell me what could be better about it. And I challenge you to clone it and duplicate it and, and use it yourself. Uh, a lot of the patterns in these things, even if you're not doing that specific use case, you could apply it to your more serious business use cases. Um, so yeah, I've got four more days with the AI Sprint um, with Marcel, one of our community members on the weekend. Uh, we're doing a hackathon and we're going to be building a, a data assistant that knows statistics and these sorts of things and can crunch data analytics Fingers crossed, that's definitely going to be the most complicated thing we've built. Um, but before I hand off back to Bart, I just want to say I'd love if you guys follow along and get inspired to build. If you do build something, send it to me. And since we did launch on Product Hunt today, now I'm not allowed to ask you to upvote it. 
but I'm going to share this link here. What would be great is if you could check it out and then show your support if you like it. Thanks, Bob. Brilliant, Max. Thank you. Um, let me just quickly check if there's any questions. Could you could you share the link to your to your email spy here, Max? People are asking for it. Oh, I most certainly can. <laughs> and Max is our new DevRel here. Francesco was asking that. Yes. Can you, can you say a bit more about that role, Max? Maybe oh, people find so, it interesting. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, I guess my title is senior developer advocate, but we can kind of throw that away because I think what what my role really is at NDN is a bit of a resident flow grammar. Um, you know, we have Bart focusing on community, um, and that is a lot of different things, right? Events and everything. So I get to focus a bit more on the subset of the community, basically help evangelize um, them building, unblocking them building, and, and creating educational content. I think a lot of us are inductive learners. I think for a tool like NN, it's a lot better to see something that's working, that's creating value than, you know, read a novel. So that's the kind of stuff that I want to create. And also, I think a lot of the stuff is already happening in the community. So be a catalyst for that. Tell the community stories. Every meetup I go to, there's so many fascinating things all of you guys are working on. I also want to, as we ramp up, help tell that story. So focus on the sprint right now. We're going to wrap that up and basically do a retro and figure out how we do this in a more sustainable way, because I would probably die if we continued in the sprint format. But yeah, so that, <laughs> that's what my role is and exactly what it's going to look like might change over the next months, but it's basically using edit and showing people how fantastic it is and showing, I think specifically how it works in prod and the learnings from that. Cause I think it's our community that actually knows the best on those things. Yeah. Super cool. Thanks Max. <clears throat> and so, yeah, from, from one developer aspect to the next, uh, our next speaker is Jenny Sukodolskaya from Quadrants. Uh, she's developer advocate there as well. And uh, Jenny will briefly remind us what semantic search is <clears throat> and show us what a vector search data bear like, database like Quadrants can provide beyond semantic search. She will demonstrate how to build an N uh, build in N8N a reg recommendation chatbot and why it is better than asking GPT to recommend something for you. So you ready to be amazed, Jenny? Yeah. Uh, firstly, Bart, kudos uh, on the second time. Your surname pronunciation of mine was chef's kiss. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I I would consider it the best start. And uh, actually, circling back to Max, uh, I had a couple of times uh, also explaining to people uh, what is developer advocate. And I think I developed my own formula. I call uh, developer advocate a uh, stand up comedian in IT. So, like when you take the both and you just combine it in one. So I'm here to entertain and uh, I'm gonna do exactly what uh, Bart read. And I hope after all of this cool things with the AI sprint, I won't make you disappointed because honestly, I am looking at Max's job with a little bit of fear because he's setting the, you know, the plank for others here. And I, I want my sleep. So guys, you don't do that to your colleagues in the field. Um, so I'm going to firstly give, throw in a very, very little slideshow explaining what is vector databases. I'm pretty sure you all guys already know what is that, but it's just a general reminder. Um, and if you don't know, it's going to be clearer. And then I'm going to show a little demo. And I mean, let's see how it's going to go, but I hope it's going to work out and you will like what we built yesterday with Aleg. And also, I want to separately say kudos to Oleg. He wanted to call me yesterday for 30 minutes to go over the case. We spent, in the end, one hour, 30 minutes talking about bugs in the both sides. And I loved it, honestly, so much. Uh, I think we did something very fun. So uh, about vector databases. Uh, so what are we talking here about? I okay. guess this is just your fault. Have a good week. Opa. Okay, so the first thing that you have to start with explaining what is vector database is about embeddings and embeddings is simply vector representation of all data that surrounds you. It can be textual, it can be image, it can be audio, it can be video, it can be anything. It's just one of the ways to present your data in machine readable format that you can basically perform some mathematical operations on it. For example, the operation of similarity. So in this space of representations, some things, which is example like text, would be similar. Say cheese and gouda. 
it's semantically similar things. So when presented as neural embeddings, they're going to be pretty close. And this is exactly where we get these representations from. We get them from neural networks, which are like now super big thing. I think basically you can't find a person who doesn't know about them. And uh, this is happening like this representations are possible because they see, for example, if we're talking about text, they see so much text that at some point they develop this pattern understanding and see that some words are belonging together and they're more similar and some words are like more far apart. And in this numerical representation, vector representation, we can then perform different operations. And, uh, I mean, here is an example, like, you know, no words overlap, no whatsoever, but it's very, very, very simple sentences to us. And why, uh, what in this picture doing vector databases where they are about searching this information, this encoded mathematical information in a very big space of these representations, because if you can imagine if we are working with data at some point we have a grandiose, like um, the amount of points is humongous, the amount of data that we want to see to compare its similarity, find out what is similar, find out like what is there. And for that, we need a specific instrument. So it was the same for relational databases, which stored the data in a specific format. But with this embeddings, which are coming from uh, neural networks work, we need a specific tool. And these are vector databases because they allow to store these vector representations of documents that you are searching, of sentences, of text, of images, of videos at the big, big, big scale, which happens usually when you upload the data, you encode the data, you store it. And then at the inference moment with vector databases, you just ask some question. It's also converted to this mathematical vector representation. And then in this huge space that we have behind stored in the database, the huge space of points and representations, we find a similar candidate. I am going to actually show you when I'm going to be demoing a representation of films, which are going to be encoded as this mathematical vectors and shown as a points, uh, how like our database um, combines them together uh, behind like under the hood. So uh, why they're so big right now, this vector databases? And I think now I'm going to say the, um, the word which now people either hate or love. It's literally a rug. It's like retrieval augmented generation. And I think that was the catalyst of the popularity of this vector databases because they are used under the hood with these models. Because when these models arise, like two, three years ago, we saw their potential. We were like, wow, finally we can throw away Google or whatever is that and ask any question in a simple form to this model. And it's gonna provide me with an answer and, and I'm gonna live in the perfect world where I will know everything. But then you start noticing that when you provided questions, it starts sometimes generating some very strange stuff, which is not true or which is absolutely like, not related to reality, it never happened. And you think like, what is that? And that is hallucinations because even the biggest model that was trained on the biggest amount of data from internet is limited to this training data. And we can't trust it with answering our question correctly without providing to it some context, some external context. And the perfect thing for st storing that context is actually a vector database, which allows under the hood to perform the fast search for something that we want to find out. For example, be it a documentation, we ask some question, it's not keys. I am going to ask like how to build, um, I don't know, how to build a search in Quadrant, how to install an A10 AI hosted kit or whatever. If I'm going to just search it in Google with keywords, it's not going to work perfectly because who knows if in documentation there are like 
the same words that you are formulating the question. But uh, if you are going to convert it to mathematical representation and use it in the vector database, it's going to find you a similar answer, similar chunk of the documentation. It's going to give it to our model, and it's going to generate a beautiful answer related to documentation, for example. And then we're going to see basically this powerful instrument, which allows us to have a search engine to which we don't have to specifically formulate some questions like thinking about the keyword or thinking about how to ask something and uh, not getting any answer. But we can just talk with it like with a chatbot. And also it's not limited only to text. It also can work with images, with videos, with audios, because everything is basically can be represented in this vector form. So I'm from Quadrant, and Quadrant is one of the vector databases, which is using one of the latest algorithms for that, written in Rust, and obviously is the best because why I'm here, if not to advertise it. But the thing is that beyond the classical search API, which some people think about semantic search, and uh, they say, OK, you can do, you can compare the vectors. Wow, is there anything else? I am used to use my relational databases with this equal this filtering and order by. We also have that. We can provide nested filters and different types of aggregating information, not only semantically, but exactly in all the types of combinations of that, which, like, you know, when you can take the both, like the best of both cases, it's always the perfect solution. But I guess one of the interesting features that we have, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate today, is recommendational API, and it works on the pain that some people, when they search for something, they not only want something specific, they also don't want something specific. For example, like as I'm going to present today, I'm going to do a super small, short movie recommender system. I, sometimes I want to watch some film, which is about friendship, but I don't want to see anything about war or pain or blood because you know what, I'm not in the mood. 2024 is already a year, you know? So that's what can be done behind in our knowledge base in Quadrant. And today is exactly what I want to demo you. I want to show you on Quadrant on a free cluster that we have. So if you want to replicate it and do it with your own data, also try it. That would be nice. I want to show you a demo of how to create a simple movie recommendation agent where you just write in the chat, hey, I'm sitting home. I want to watch something today about love, but without vampires, because after Twilight, I'm traumatized for already 10 years. And it's going to solve your longing. And not only it's going to solve it, but you also can do it just in NA10 and without coding, which honestly I loved a lot because I had a lot of fun yesterday trying to build that around. And that's what's going to be about. I don't want to do this demo also from scratch. Of course, this workflow is not as big as Max showed for his AI sprint, but still, like, I mean, look at this sausage. I think I'm going to do a detailed video. I will use the experience with Max and I'm going to do a detailed video, I say tomorrow, doing it from scratch. But now let's just look at the components and let's just see what it can do and in general, like understand what is happening. So before I am going to show that it's actually working as it intended to work, so as a movie recommendation chat rug system, uh, I want to show the first part which is uploading the data to Quadrant, to Quadrant Block, Quadrant Vector Store, because if we want to create a movie recommendation system, we want in our database to store the movie, these descriptions, so they're gonna be retrieved and then recommended to the user. And uh, of course it doesn't have to be movies, but then, uh, it don't have to be movies, but in our particular case, I took them. And uh, based on that, our model, our agent, is going to do all the recommendations without the ability to invent some movies which don't exist, for example. So um, to upload data to Quadrant, uh, we usually need like our cluster. I have cluster. It's actually free tier because, I don't know, it's enough. And I already have created a small 
so I'm going to be using this data set. I took it from Kaggle and uh, honestly, it's a good choice if you want to showcase something. It's top thousand IMDb movies with their short description. So you can see what is there. And um, to save your time, I'm not going to upload all 1000 points now because as you understand, they have to be converted to mathematical representations or to embeddings in our case with open AI model, but you can take any open source model because guys have here also like hug and face and uh, they also have open llama if I am not mistaken. Yeah, oh, or llama too. Um, so to make it more fast, I just wanna in general, firstly show you how to do it for smaller amount of points. So what is happening here? We're downloading my data set from GitHub. We're extracting the file, which is pretty similar. And then let me limit um, the amount of points, amount of vectors uploaded to the database to 50, for example, should be enough for the demonstration. And, and here we're going to, since this is the, the one of the containers that we are already saving for a bigger demonstration, let me create a smaller container here for 50 vectors and see how it's gonna go. And I am gonna run this. So this is gonna upload our representations made by OpenAI uh, embeddings to our database. And it's gonna uh, take from the, from the data from the, so we can see it from here. We get the file. In the file, we have all of these movies, the classical form. And so here it's gonna take all of this information about movies and it's gonna encode in mathematical like representation only descriptions because user usually asking for some movie recommendation is going to ask something around description. He's gonna say, okay, give me something about like love, but not much about like sweetness, school romance. And that's what we want to basically search around. And let's test this step fastly. And as you can see, they're uploading one by one to our database. And let me show how does it look here. So for each cluster, we have a dashboard. And this dashboard shows already points uploaded. And I can show for our bigger collection. So this smaller collection is creating now. You can see that now it has 20 vectors. It's gonna be more when it's gonna finish uploading. But let's look at already done uploaded big collection of 1000 movies. So you can see how they are stored. We have all the metadata uh, about them. We have a content uh, and we have a vector representation which is created through the, through the OpenAI embeddings, which is 1,536 points. And we can see them on the graph, how they are looking and are they are close or not. So we have all the different fun to play around. And for example, let me see in the visual, visualize all the points that we have in our films. And for example, we see something very close on the graph and it is here, Harry Potter and Prisoner of Azkaban. And the point next to it is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So they are grouped by description and you can see that the points similar to each other are about the similar films. For example, here is Star Wars and Star Wars. So the same way when we are gonna ask for the recommendation where our database is gonna find a point similar to some of the films that are already existing and point as further as possible from the negative recommendation of the user. So we can see all the 50 items uploaded and we can already check it in our collection. So that's how it's done in general. And now I would love to demonstrate you what we did yesterday with the AI engine, because I think it's like super cool. Firstly, I wanna literally show how does it work and then briefly go over it. So there is a chat and uh, this is a movie recommender agent. And I want some to watch some film 
which is about sport, but not about baseball, for example. And then we will see the recommendation being provided to us. which is going in the meanwhile to call the tool. And it's calling the tool. Oh, I love this demo effect. It's when you're doing something for 1 million times and then it works perfectly. And then the demo comes and then nothing comes. Let me try again. So I want to film about sport, but please nothing about baseball. Uh-huh, and we got our answer. And our answer is... Sorry, it was supposed to be in the chat. Yes. So the wrestler, the story of an Indian athlete and champion, and the, the story of a dog, which is kind of a sportsman, but not much. We can see that it called the tool, which we built here. This tool is basically our workflow. And this tool is calling our database and our recommendation IP, which returns top three films from our database with the score of similarity. As you can see, it's not that high, honestly speaking. I guess because out of 1,000 films, we don't have so many films close about like sportsmen, but not baseballers. But uh, actually, two, top two answers are pretty good. So it's about the professional wrestler. And it's about the story of an Indian athlete and nothing about baseball. Uh, so here, our agent is just talking to uh, OpenAI model. So it's like GPT. GPT just is used to call the tool. And it used to basically beautify the answer of the tool, the retrieved data from the database. And what is happening here? So here, we are firstly taking our positive and negative example because our, um, our model is smart enough to provide us, based on our request, a positive and a negative example. So the positive example is a film about sports. And, and the negative example is nothing related to baseball. And then uh, we embed these examples in the same vector representation as we did here, because we need to compare the same vectors. It makes sense. You compare something similar to something similar. Then is basic mapping of the points. We're taking our embeddings, our vector representations, and there we are sending uh, them to Quadrant Recommendation app, API, which basically looks like this. You provide a positive example, to something that should be close, and a negative example, something that should be far, and some strategy of aggregation. After that, Quadrant returns us points. Uh, so what, what is recommended? You can see here, I limited it to three points. So it recommended top three points, which are the closest. We fetch them from database because we want to know what they are about. And you can see that it's fetching all the descriptions, uh, like about the wrestler, the name, the film, and yada, yada. And then we just beautifully combine them and then we send them to agent. And that's how our agent can basically build their answer on something which is like truly our document in the database. And I guess the cool thing is that you can do it not with just a movie data set, which is pretty easy, but you can do it with your own documentation, for example, or with your own product or with Amazon or with house searching. And then you are just gonna say, okay, uh, could you please recommend me something say I'm searching for a house, for renting a house, like house with two rooms, but please without like red wall colors because they make me psyched or something. And it's gonna be done with this workflow without coding in one click. And honestly, that's sick and I love it. So I am super grateful for the ability not only to present 
but literally to just try the tool because that was so much fun combining this simple solution. Brilliant, Jenny. And I know how hard it used to be to build recommendation engines and to see you do it in such a short time is it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's, also the... honestly, it's, it's like kudos to you guys. I mean, also kudos to Quadrant, what can I say? <laughs> but, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a beautiful combination. And then I'm, I'm reading the chats and people are, are super impressed with your tools and the visualization, the, the demonstration of how the movies work close together in the vector space, even though you're like, Flattening, what is it, twelve dimensional space to to two? I imagine. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh... it's it's simplification, of course. It's like mm -hmm. uh, if I would be mathematical, it's like principal component analysis. But yeah, it's like basically flattening into one dimension. Mm -hmm. But it's still, as you see, it grouped Harry Potter's together. So it, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Sense. That's, that's really good. Yeah, and I I think uh, yeah, people are saying we didn't see that in other products yet. So that that is really really cool. Um, yeah, I'm I'm reading a lot of praise. I don't think we have a lot of questions unless someone has one right now uh, who wants to share one oh i noticed my uh, ceo in the comments so all the questions can go directly <laughs> <laughs> oh no, hang on no, there, there are some questions here um so marcus asks how would i keep the embedded documentation up to date in a vector database i would want to have help articles updated and added and need to embed them do I need to embed them once a day, or could I make sure the docs are always in the vector space? Uh, so basically, do you need to like re-encode everything all the time, or can you have, do you have a smarter I mean, strategy for that? To... No, I mean um, it depends on the how often your data is changing because like the, the new data arrives, you just encode the new part of it and add it like you would upload any data to database, right? If you want to store it there, you just upload something new, but you don't have to re-encode the old ones because they are already in the right representation there. If something changes, you will have to re-upload it just because it makes sense. Like, for example, I was storing some, say we had like a guideline, we had our documentation, then it completely changed. Uh, you, of course, want to re-upload it because the old data is safe, but it, it is just a common sense. If your data is changing a lot, I would definitely do a day shadow re-upload. It's fast because, uh, I mean, Quadrant is built on Rust. All the uh, encoding is done. Like we have vector stores, which is up to 520 million points, and it's working pretty fast because we have horizontal and vertical scaling. So it should be like a piece of cake. But it's good to have a, a strategy in place to minimize the encoding costs, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So that's it. Okay, that makes sense. Um, another question is from, oh, hang on, I just scroll out of view. Uh, Colleen, she said, this was great and inspiring. I started looking at, at Quadrant the other day and wasn't sure where to start. Will this be an available template that we can dive in and look at? So if you could share this with us, I can make sure Absolutely. it gets published as well. Yeah. I would be happy to. I also was planning to do tomorrow the whole video of setting this up from scratch, but uh, oh, nice. you guys need to teach me how to share NA10 workflows because I think I am kindly using, kindly provided Oleg's account. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he has all of my data. <laughs> <laughs> we we yeah. have a workflow library where we, where we can publish these, yes. Yeah, but you know what? It's a very interesting uh, thought and a comment to us that the person didn't know where to start from. And we are going to, like, I would be happy if somebody reaches out to me and says, what is the problem with starting? Because that's exactly the number one thing that you would like for your product that the people feel like they want to start. I think recently we have doing a big job of moving very easy, quick to start tutorials to our cloud. So maybe it's the nicest way would be to start like sign up in the cloud and try to just click around without even reading the documentation because who reads documentation? You just, I was with end to end. I was like, ah, I'm gonna figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but you had an Oleg, right? That helps. Yeah, with, I uh, mean, yeah. Oleg was like documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is really cool. Let, let, let's make sure this gets published. So w when we share these videos, there will be links below them to uh, to Jenny's full video as well as to the template. So you can download it and get started right away. And let's make sure to include your 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 voucher code as well for that free one 
gigabytes uh, cluster. Oh yeah, it's, it's it's just for everybody, for okay. everybody, everybody, everybody. You nice. can sign up. Great. It's, yeah. it's there. Um, let me see. Another question is from Carter Harrison, and he asks, "What makes Quadrant different from other vector data databases like Pinecone?" Oh, it's an often asked question. I would say my personal opinion. The thing is, like, I've heard a lot of different uh, answers based on, like, who is it? We have four DevRels. We have four different answers and everything. I would say for me personally, except, like, the scalability in the thing would be, firstly, the, uh, the reaction on how fast we develop the features reacting to the community. If you look at the Quadrants community, it's very, very responsive very, very open source and uh, very managed. So our CTO is sitting there daily answering to all the questions because he just loves his job, honestly speaking. So for example, this visualization was a thing that everybody wanted and we pretty fastly did it. And so except from just being a good, decent product for vector search, which is already around for four years. So it was before the old hype and it wasn't done on the knee, like, you know, behind the scenes, behind the LLMs, thinking faster, faster, we want to earn our money. So it's not only like a stable product, it's a product which adapts to what their community needs very fast. In a true open and source that's why spirit. I to talk <laughs> to this company because I, I liked how the community works. <laughs> Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. I have a couple more. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna pick a few. Um, so that Mark Scrivo asks: Is there uh, any way of identifying deltas of the data, deltas of the data, so that only new data is added? I think that's kind of answered already, uh, Mark. Uh, that that's like on the on the N8N Bye. side. You need to like figure out which data is new, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that we don't have like a standard uh, process for that. Um... By the way, just a quick tip here. In any then we have a compare data set node, which would make this easier because you just connect two inputs basically, and it would give you like a difference between data based on some criteria. So that might be a good use case for okay. Cool. Thank you. Um... Jim Lee asks, when will we get an official Quadrant N8N node? Still too many steps need to manually generate the embeddings for the recommended API. Would love to only just have to supply the text instead. Well, that's not to me. No, <laughs> that that's not. I think not that's Oleg. <laughs> Is it on our roadmap? Or? I can't promise any. Uh, <laughs> like I framed you, <laughs> I live with it. No, uh, and I actually, when you reiterated with the question about checking if the data is same or not, I realized what you were asking about uh, because I interpreted it wrongly. And of course, in Quadrat, you can check if there is already some data because we have payload, which is the fields which you can filter with. So when you insert, you can just addition basically the filter, how to say, it, condition, condition, thank you. I'm sorry, English is not my mother tongue. <laughs> so you can add a filter condition and uh, that will help you not to insert the same data because it's gonna be already detected that it's in database. Yeah, uh, for some reason, I was trying to understand like if the data is being already saved or if it's, my, I don't know what, how I understood the question first time. <laughs> was too excited after the demo. And also I saw somebody asking the question about PDF documents and if Quadrant can work with them. Quadrant can work with every data. Uh, you just need to find a way to convert it to vector representation. And with NA10, for example, you can easily do that. We did that with uh, Oleg yesterday. You just upload a PDF document, you split it in chunks and you upload it to Quadrant and it takes like what, three blocks of NA10, four? Okay, maybe four, I will give you that. Um, last question because we're running out of time here. Um, Alex asks, should we ask a Quadrant node with insert documents for the first pass as shown as the demo and a separate workflow with a call to Quadrant Points API for upsorts to account for new source document versions, not sure I. Like yeah, that's, more I... An, that's more an N8N question, Alexia. Yeah, that looks like your initial upload versus processing the deltas, right? Yeah. 
Yes, it was, it was just a question. If we had a PDF that went through and then that was version, someone made some updates, could I overwrite the points in my collection for the old document? So when I'm chatting with it, I'm not referencing the old doc. I've managed to go in and, and remove those points. So my, my vector store is always accurate. First, I'm trying to figure out, is it questions still to me or to Brad? I guess that's a question to us. Uh, so we currently don't support the upsert in the uh, operation for quadrants. We support for some other vector stores, but we didn't add it for quadrant yet. So you would have to check it yourself based on this metadata, uh, see if it's already there and then repopulate it. Yeah, I guess it's using API it would be now the same with recommendation API. I mean, guys, faster, faster. So many requests for quadrant groups. I am. Um, OK, so th there, there's actually more questions here, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to uh, wrap up. And um, let me just quickly go back to my slides. Hang on. Um, if you have other questions, guys, please head over to the forum on community.nsn.io and uh, open a topic there, and we can continue the conversation there. Um, so for now, uh, all I want to say is thanks for joining us here. Thanks, Jenny, for your fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed the example and the, the ease of achieving such an impressive result. Um, we hope to see you again at some point in the future. This was really nice. Our next Hangout is going to be on October 31st. It's going to be a workflow showcase, as I mentioned earlier. If you want to participate and win uh, an awesome n and notebook, head over to n8n.io slash community slash events, and uh, you can submit your idea there. And for now, that's it. <clears throat> if there's anything else we can do for you, please email community at n8n.io. That will go straight to me, and we'll get back in touch with you as soon as we can.